that's what we were singing about, wasn't it? The majesty of God. I mean, when we're in the presence of God, things change. You see, what we have is a real relationship with a real God that really changes us because we really need change. Amen? I mean, we're a mess. Amen? Anybody out there got it going well? I mean, you've got no problems. Everything's going good. Okay, good. Then you need change just like I do. And, and tonight we're going to be reading from 2 Timothy. We're going to put it out on the board for you. And um, the scripture goes like this. In verse number 5, Paul says, I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. This is Paul talking to Timothy. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for Him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. This is some of the last things that Paul ever wrote. Second Timothy was his last letter. And Timothy is a guy, he was a son in the faith. In 1 Timothy, Paul calls him his spiritual son. So he's like one of the young, young men that Paul uh, had come in contact with and had grown up in the ministry under the apostle. And Paul, at this time, is in prison. Now, I want you to kind of think about what might be going through Timothy's mind. My mentor is in prison. Sometimes when we read the Bible, we don't think about the emotional aspects. We just kind of look at it as a bunch of guys that just kind of walk through life. You know what I mean? And if you've ever seen the movies, have you all ever seen some of the Christian movies about, you know, the life of Jesus and things like that? And how Jesus has got a, lot, got a little glazed look on his face. You know, he's got a little halo over his head and he kind of walked through life. I mean, we kind of disconnect emotion from the story and that's just not very accurate. Because Timothy was a man like some of us. Paul was a man like some of us. They were people. They had real problems. They had real emotions. They had real feelings. And they went through stuff just like you and I. So ladies and gentlemen, when we think about struggling and life being difficult, I want you to know that the people in the Bible were the same. They went through the same types of problems that we go through. I mean, it might be a little bit different because I don't know if they had any Bible verses about road rage. Didn't have much of a problem with that with camels and things, you know what I mean? But they had real problems. And in this case, Paul's in prison. He's actually waiting to be executed. And you remember the song we sing sometimes about, you know, Lord Jesus, you're good to me. How can this be? I, I think maybe Timothy might have been thinking, my mentor's in prison getting ready to be executed. How can this be? And I imagine he had some of the same doubts, and maybe some of the same disillusionments that you and I do. And I want to tell you why I think that. Because in this particular passage of Scripture, Paul makes a statement. He says, this is why I remind you. Say remind. You see, Paul reminded Timothy to do something. He reminded Timothy to fan into flame the spiritual gift. Paul reminded him. And if Paul reminded Timothy to fan the flame, then maybe you and I need to be reminded as well. Amen? In fact, with me, I need reminding a lot because I forget a lot. I can go to sleep at night and forget by the next morning, can't you? And when it comes to spiritual warfare, the problem that I have is when I'm feeling the effects of the enemy, it's usually after some time that I kind of walk through that and I've got my head down. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I feel like, 
you know, the world's coming to an end and God's forgotten me. And then at some point, somebody reminds me that the Bible says, if God be for me, who can be against me? And someone reminds me to fan into flame the gift of God that God has given me. Everybody, everyone needs reminding. And that's why we come to church. Sometimes we, you might think that, you know, I don't know why I don't do better. And I don't know why I have to constantly be reminded. You have to be reminded because we're in the flesh. And things aren't easy. And things aren't always going to be easy. So Paul's reminding him to stir up something. And I want to suggest to you tonight that we all need to be stirred up again. And the point of this is, is that the stirring up is something that Paul tells Timothy to do. So I'm going to tell you tonight that it might be the night that you need to go back and stir it up. Amen? Now, I grew up around the 70s, and so when I keep saying stir it up, I keep remembering that song, Stir It Up, okay? So you don't know the song, do you, Tim? Well, look it up, buddy. Amen? You see, that would have been a great song to sing tonight, Blake. I know that would have made, made your night. You know what I mean? You don't know it either, do you? <laughs> ha, anybody remember that from the 70s? Anybody? Okay, amen. Right, sing the song. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> I appreciate having you in my corner over there. Literally. <laughs> anyway, there's some reasons why we need stirred up. We need to be stirred up because Satan never stops resisting us. Amen? Now, if you understand what I'm talking about, then say amen and agree with me. And if you don't understand, you will, all right? Satan never stops resisting the work of God. You may not realize this, but the sole purpose that Satan has is to stop God from doing what God said he's going to do. And God determined that he was going to use people like you. So when you say, I'm going to serve the Lord, and the Lord gives you his spiritual gift, and he starts that flame in you, Satan comes along, and his desire is to put out your fire. He will never stop. He will go away for a season, but he will find his way back. That's why we need a church, guys. That's why we need the Word of God and the Spirit of God and the people of God so that we can do the work of God. And we've got to remember something. That the reason why we are here is to do the work of God. You're not here just to make money and live and die. There is a way bigger purpose for your life. God has something in, in mind for you, and according to the Bible, he has good plans in mind for you. You see, you get to be a part of the biggest thing on the planet. There's not anything any bigger, nothing any bigger than what God is doing. And God invites us to be a part of that. That's exciting. Satan never stops resisting us. We need to be stirred up because the work can be discouraging. Everybody I know gets discouraged, including pastors. Reasons why we need to get stirred up is because we can doubt the whole thing. Listen, I want you to understand, more times than I can count, have I struggled with doubt. You ever been there? Did I make the right move? Did I go to the right place? <laughs> Did I preach the right sermon? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's easy to do because Satan is in the, the arena of doubt. We need to be stirred up because of the pain of life. Sometimes we just get discouraged because life seems to be difficult. So tonight we're going to fan it into flame. You guys want to see me start a fire up here? Fire marshals are watching, guys. I probably can't. Let's go through this scripture together. And let me try to make my point to you tonight so that you understand. Point number one is this. God is a gift giver. Paul's talking about stirring up a flame of a gift that God has given. I want you to understand tonight that when you come to salvation, salvation is a gift. The Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith, and it's not of yourself. It is the gift of God. The word grace literally means gift. When you get saved, you don't get saved because you're good. You don't get saved because of what you've done. You don't get saved because of your effort. You are saved because God gives you his salvation. And when we're saved tonight, when we're singing about the majesty of the Lord, we're singing about a God who has given us his good gifts. And when he saves us, he gives us things. God's a gift giver. In this passage of scripture, we talk about 
the gift that God gave to Timothy, which was the, the gift of the apostle. Do you realize that Ephesians says that the gifts of the ministry of the church are gifts to God's people? Apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers were all listed as gifts that God has given to the church. You see, that's why the Bible says for us to hold our leaders into to good esteem because they are gifts given to you and me from the Lord. There's the gift of the apostle and leadership. There's the gift of salvation. There's the gift of the word. God has given us his own word. Paul said in verse 5, he said to Timothy, I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know the same faith continues strong in you. There's a lot of gifts there. Timothy had a grandmother that knew about the things of God. Timothy had a mother that knew about the things of God. And the faith that was in his grandmother and in his mother, that faith came down to him. And ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so God has given his word. God gives us the gift of faith. God gives us his grace. God gives us the gifts of, this, of the church. And he is a gift-giving God. But tonight, I want to focus on the gift that God gives to every believer. And that is this. It's that God gives his Holy Spirit to his people. God gives his Holy Spirit to his people. You do not get saved apart from the Holy Spirit of God. You know that you're born again because you're born again by the Spirit of God. Jesus, when he was here, he spoke about giving the Holy Spirit. In John 14, he said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Ladies and gentlemen, did you hear that? Jesus said, this person will never leave you. He calls him the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. He said, the world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. I declare to you tonight, later is here. He is with us and he is in us, ladies and gentlemen. The one who comes alongside of us. This is how you know that you're born again. You're born by the Spirit. And can I say this to you tonight? If you are saved tonight, the Spirit of God takes up residence within you. And ladies and gentlemen, when that happens, you know it. It's not really possible to come in contact with the Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead and the Spirit of God that called the earth and world into existence and say, well, I'm not really sure it happened. <laughs> God gives every believer His Spirit. Point number two, God's gifts are powerful. His gifts aren't uh, menial. They are powerful. They're not weak. They are big. They're, they're huge. They're strong. One of the... Elements that God refers to when he talks about his spirit is the element of fire. Acts chapter 2 and verse 3. When God gave the Holy Spirit to the church, the Bible says they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Ladies and gentlemen, the fire that we're talking about tonight set a fire in my soul. Stir up the fire, fan in the flame. It's the Holy Spirit of God that God gives to each one of us. And ladies and gentlemen, I would dare say tonight that most of us need to be stirred up tonight. We need that fire stirred once again. Ladies and gentlemen, fire is a powerful change agent. When fire comes in, things change. If, if a fire came into this building tonight, most of you would head for the exit. Wouldn't you? But a fire that's controlled in the proper place is something that can be wonderful. And ladies and gentlemen, that's who the Holy Spirit is. He's not out of control. He's controlled, but he is a powerful change agent. Another word that's used in the Bible to speak of the Spirit is the word breath. In the Old Testament, it talks about the Spirit of God being God's breath that hovers over the water. I get the picture of a powerful wind, something like a hurricane that's over the water, that's driving the water. This is the power of our God. And God's pictures are pictures of a God who is big and who is powerful and who can change all of us. He can change the inside of us, which is where we need changing the most. Amen? 
You see, here's what I want to say about that. This is your next fill-in. The Spirit of God empowers us to do what we cannot do on our own. That's a big statement. That's a long statement, but we need to memorize that. Sometimes people say, I don't know how to get my life in order, and I don't know how to change, and I don't know how to feel different, and I don't know how to do different, and I don't know how to get something under control. Ladies and gentlemen, the Spirit of God is the one who brings change to you. The change that He makes in your life is so dramatic that Jesus called it a brand new birth. Something new. Ladies and gentlemen, with Christianity, there is a before and an after. I remember preaching the funeral of one of my very good friends in Tennessee. This guy was a guy that was in the, in the churches for years, but he'd never experienced real salvation. And one day he got it. And when he got it, he changed. This gentleman, his name is Larry, and he was a very good friend of mine. He was a fifth of Jack Daniels a day alcoholic. And when he got saved, it was gone immediately. There was a before and there was an after. And the guy that came after was nothing like the guy before. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are exactly the way you were before you got saved, you did not get biblical salvation. There is a before and an after. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us to do what we cannot do on our own. It's a spiritual birth. It equals change. The Spirit of God enables us to live a holy life. To love like Jesus loves. To serve God with purpose and success. The Spirit of God empowers us to comfort and encourage one another. Ladies and gentlemen, He is the flame inside of you. And the flame inside of you is the motivator, the encourager, the inspirer, the enabler, and the comforter. He is the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Is that what happened to you? Sometimes, though, for Christian people, we have trouble with our flame. Sometimes we have trouble, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about some people that are having a little trouble with their flame. Maybe that's you tonight, and maybe tonight is not for you to get stirred up. The first one, the first problem flame is what I'm going to call the flame in name only. The flame in name only. Now... Y'all know what's up here right now, right? We've got some wood. We've got a fire pit. We've got something to stir it up with. And I can stir all day long. And I can stir all day long. But you know what? I'm never going to get a fire. You know why? Because there's no fire there. A lot of people are like that in the church. They're trying to stir up what doesn't exist. They come into church and they say, well, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to work at this a little better. I'm going to be better. But every time, it ends up just empty. Nothing changes. Just dry. Just dead. No change at all. The Bible talks about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I want you to put the scripture on the board. Look what Paul says. He says to the Thessalonians, he said, our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power. So with a lot of people, their salvation is only words. It's word only. Some folks' problem with the flame is that they have the flame in name only. They only say they have a flame. They don't really have a flame. Because when the gospel comes to you, the gospel doesn't come to you in word only, but what else? With power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know what the deep conviction means? The deep conviction means that you know something's happened. <laughs> A lot of people may be sitting in the room. You're just like that. You're doing everything you can to stir up a bunch of dead sticks. Nothing changes. That's a problem. 
The good news about that is tonight is that if you come to the Lord Jesus tonight, you know what can happen? Lord Jesus will save you, and he'll place his spirit within you, and that fire will come alive. That's the first, the first problem is the flame in name only. Then there's also the flame out. The flame out. The flame out is the guy that has the flame, and there's a lot of action in the early days, but it goes out quick. Can anybody see what I got here in my hand? Y'all ever seen one of these? You know, I don't have an extra hand, so I can't light it. But if I lit that, it'd make a lot of noise, lots of action, but it wouldn't take very long, and it'd be gone, flamed out. That's the way a lot of you might be tonight. Lots of activity in the early days, but you just went flamed out. You just burn out. Goes out quick. And I don't know about you, but other than having these on Independence Day, right? Other than having these on that, what good is that? It's not good for anything, isn't it? You can't heat your house with it. Can you? I mean, you can't really do anything with it. It's just something that makes a lot of, you know, just, just something to look at. And then it's gone. Some of you haven't taken care of your flame. And you just kind of flamed out. There's another problem with a flame. It's called the Fading out flame. The fading out. Now, <laughs> I am not an outdoorsy campfire. Everybody's laughing because y'all know, don't you? I mean, my idea of, of outdoor stuff is going from the car to the bookstore, you know. You know, with my hat and gloves on, you know. I mean, that's it, you know. I, you know, I, don't, I don't know anything about that. But here's what I've learned. I've learned that. If you have a campfire, that you have to kind of take care of it because if you don't, it's going to go out, right? And once in a while, you got to do what? You have to stir it. But you know what? If you don't put some more wood on the fire, what's going to happen? It's going to go. It's not going to be there at all. That's the way some of y'all are, are. That's the way some of y'all are doing tonight. There's lack of wood. I mean, it's fading out. And and I think the spiritual thing is is that you're just not available to the Spirit of God. You see, if you don't put what needs to go on the fire, the fire doesn't flame out, flame up. And I think some of us have just not made ourselves available to the Spirit of God. What am I talking about? Let's put Scripture up here. Can we put Scripture? Do we have it? Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. You know what that means? It means you make yourself available to what God's doing. And when God says move, you move. When God says go, you go. When God says stop, you stop. And I think some of us need to make ourselves available to the Spirit. You're just fading out. I mean, y'all see what that is, don't you? That's a match, which is probably a little more useful than a sparkler. But if I lit that match, how long would that be, be around? It'd eventually burn up what's little, what little I've given to it. But if I put the right stuff together and the right stuff together and put all this together and throw it on this fire, what do I have? You can have something that means something. But i got to make myself available to the Spirit of God. So you got the flame in name only. you got the flame out. you got the fading out flame. And you also, the last one, you got the drowned out flame. What do you do when you're done with the campfire? What do you do? Huh? You throw some of this? Right? Right? You know what some of you got a problem with, don't you? It's what Paul said to the Thessalonians. Can we put it up here? 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Do not quench the Spirit of God. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. 
You see, what he's describing is, is a person who is not living filled with God's Spirit. You keep putting it out. You see, if you're really saved, the Spirit of God will show you things you need to do and show you things that you need to live with and show you how to obey Him. But you know what? When you disobey God, you're putting out the Spirit's fire. Disobedience will put it out. You see, the Bible says in Ephesians 5.18, I like what he says here, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. You might want to take a real hard look at that. Instead, be filled with what? Now, if, if you're constantly filled with something other than the Spirit, what you're doing is this, okay? Now, if you want to just really see something that will open your eyes, read all of Ephesians 5. Because Paul takes about, seems like an hour, and explains all the different activities that we do that put out the Spirit's fire. All of the little disobedience things that we do. See, disobedience always puts out the fire. And ladies and gentlemen, if we keep throwing water on our fire, we're not going to be burning very much. And I want to say in our world, church isn't burning very much. We've got a problem with our flame. Point number four, I want to show you that many times we simply fan the wrong flame. Here's the thing. I wish I had another one over here because that would represent the wrong flame. You see, this is supposed to be the right flame. This is the flame that's supposed to work. This is the flame that I'm supposed to be able to stir up and get something out of. But the problem is in the world today, there's a many people that say, I got that flame, but they're fanning this flame. They're fanning the wrong one. They're putting their enthusiasm, their time in the wrong things. Let me give you a couple examples. There's the flame of fear. What did Paul say to Timothy? He said, God did not give us the spirit of fear. Did he say that? But yet many of us in the church, that's exactly what we're fanning. There are people that call themselves Christians, but yet live in fear every day. And they fan the fear inside their own brains. I want you to understand something that all of us are tempted to do that. Because when Satan comes to resist us, Satan will come to resist us to tell us that what you're trying to do will fail. Hello? Now, if you're like, well, he's never told me that. Well, then obviously you're not trying to do anything in the kingdom of God. Because if you're, tr if you're working in the kingdom of God and you realize that God's got a purpose for you. And that God's got a better plan for you than, than just eat, sleep, live, and die then the things that you put your mind to do, Satan will come and say, you can't do that. I guarantee you that's the truth every day of the week. Because Satan's plan is to get you to quit. And yet we feed the flame of fear. We feel like this, I will fail in my pursuit of God's will. I can't tell you how many times I've thought of that. If I do this, I'm going to fail. If I make this decision, I'm going to fail. If I, if I go in this direction, I'm, it's not going to work. And then some people, because they're so paralyzed by fear, they say, I will not pursue God's will. I just simply won't do it because I'm afraid. Many times we feel like we're afraid of what the enemy will do to us. I'm going to tell you that every time God calls you to do something, he's going to call you to step out on faith. If it has to make sense to you, ladies and gentlemen, it might not be God's will. Because God will cause you to do things that are bigger than you can do. Amen. I don't know how many times I can explain this to you. But 20 years ago, God called me into missions. And I knew nothing about it. Zero. All I heard from God was there were some people in my town who couldn't speak English that needed to hear the gospel. And 20 years later, I'm still going back and forth. And it's not because I'm doing a good job. It's because God will always do above and beyond what you expect he can do. And if you're paralyzed by fear, you're never going to do anything because it's never going to just all line up and make sense. Not only is there the flame of fear, but there's a the flame of defeat. Like I'm already defeated. 
In church work, it's easy to feel that way because Satan is always resisting us and Satan is always against us and it always looks like it's not going to work. We have negative thinking. And when we're thinking negatively, we're basically agreeing with the enemy that God is not really for me. And then many times we have a flame of defeat with discouragement. We start thinking, am I really going to succeed? And then we can get to the place where we have disillusionment, where we start to doubt whether or not it's true at all. The flame of fear and the flame of defeat, that's what we're fanning tonight. We're fanning the wrong stuff, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a God that's bigger than our fears. We've got a God that's bigger than our weaknesses. We've got a God that's bigger than our defeats. And ladies and gentlemen, in Jesus' name, when we decide to obey the Lord and go with Him, we will succeed. And then the last one, last fear, uh, flame that I want to talk about this wrong is the flame of selfishness. Selfishness. You see, when we're fearful and we start thinking negatively, we start living in the flame of defeat and then finally we just get selfish. Well, this didn't work, so I'll try something else. Life's not working. Serving the Lord is just too hard and the enemy's too strong and God's kind of abandoned me so I'll just go and I'll just do what I want to do. And we have the idea that the world will make it better. Or we go to sin and go to pleasure and that's going to make it better. Basically what we're saying is, God, I've got a better plan for my life than you do. And we fan the wrong flame. And the more we fan the wrong flame, the less this flame becomes and the less useful we are in the kingdom of God. And the less useful we are in the kingdom of God, the more life doesn't make sense because we were created for the kingdom of God. See, tonight, we've got problems with our flame. We need to fan it. We need to get away from putting out the Spirit's fire. We need to move away from this dead faith and this word-only faith, this faith that doesn't exist, this faith that's just kind of on paper only, ladies and gentlemen, we need to come tonight to a gospel that is real and vibrant and filled with the power, indwelt with the power of God's Holy Spirit based upon God's Holy Word of which God used His Word and His Spirit to call the earth into existence. And if God can do that, He can change your life. So tonight... Here's what we do. To take action with the message. The first thing I want to encourage you to do is. I need to make sure that I have the flame. I need to make sure that I've got this. This old dead. Empty. Dry. Heartless. No motion. No spirit. No power. Dead. Lifeless religion needs to go. We come to the spirit of the living God. And by faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ uses his spirit to connect us to the body of Christ. And he gives his spirit to us. And that which is dead comes to life. And tonight you've got to make sure you've got the flame because this will never do. The Bible says that when the gospel comes, he comes with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with much assurance. And so tonight, I first make sure I've got the right flame. If you don't know that you have the right flame, tonight is the night that you need to get the right flame. You say, how do I get the right flame? Trust Jesus. Amen. Jesus died for you. He went to the grave for you. He rose again for you. He gave the Spirit of God for you. And I declare to you tonight that anyone who comes to Jesus, He will not reject you tonight. You can know it. You can have a flame fire up that will make all of Metropolis see. You won't be running around with a little match tonight. You won't have to live old sparkler faith tonight. But ladies and gentlemen, those of you that know this, you have responded to the gospel in your life. You know it. You know that Jesus Christ is real because he has come into your life and he has changed you and you can remember that. 
Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2, for you to go back to your first love, and that's what we call you to do tonight. When you go back to your first love, you start to fan the right flame. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we fan the right flame. Let's get rid of the wrong flame. Let's move away from the wrong flame. How do we do that? It's called repentance. You might say, I don't know how I can stop being negative. I don't know how I can stop being defeated. I don't know how I can get over being fearful. I don't know how I can stop these bad habits. I can tell you, just fan the right flame. It's called repentance. I move away from this. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could kick that over tonight, I'd kick it. We got to get serious about who we are and what we want. I don't want to just flame out. I don't want to walk in before Jesus and say, here, Jesus, this is what I did for you. I want to be filled with his spirit. I want to be filled with his presence. I want to do his will. I want to light the path so that people can see who Jesus is. I want to live for him. I want to be a part of what he's doing. And ladies and gentlemen, as a Christian believer, I want to tell you this wrong flame is just all wrong. It doesn't work. It only leads to death. The gifts that the wrong flame brings are gifts of death. And he'll destroy you. And we got to move away from the wrong flame. And then we make ourselves available to the Spirit of God. We come to the Spirit of God and we say, Lord, here we are. I made myself available. I, I'm not going to flame out. I'm going to put my person in your path. And I'm going to stay in step with you. And then when you, you tell me to move and you motivate me, I'm not going to put out the Spirit's fire. I'm going to be there. I want to be a flame tonight. I want to spread fame to the name and fan the flame tonight. Make myself available to the Spirit of God and move with Him. Ladies and gentlemen, have you been sitting on your comfortable dead flame tonight it's time eastland life church it's time that we flame up it's time that we realize that we've been given a privilege to be here look what god has done with us and look what god wants to do in this community and what he wants to do around the world ladies and gentlemen i was talking to our media team tonight you don't realize it but people all over the country watch our services and I've got their stories, stories of marriages being restored, stories of people who get saved, stories of people who came off the wrong flame and now they're living the right flame and they've joined local assemblies and they've gotten right with God. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an awesome privilege, but we can't do that with that old lifeless flame tonight. We need to flame up. We need to fire up. There's nothing that can stop us. Because if God be for us, who can be against us?